All right, ladies and gentlemen, please, uh, we're going to start right now. Uh, we are, uh, I think this is like part seven or eight of Royalty and Romance. Uh, we are, we left in a little, a little bit of a cliffhanger. Uh, we spoke last time, it was a couple of weeks ago, Mechila, I cannot make it last week, long story. Um, but, um, you know, I definitely miss teaching this class. Um, we've spent the last, um, you know, big chunk of the summer, largest part of the summer, speaking a little bit about this idea of um, the people, the characters that make up the uh, Mashiach. And we've asked a little bit about, you know, why, why was it that these personalities and these circumstances, these interesting circumstances, found themselves in a position to make these very difficult choices? And uh, why does this, why are these choices, these scenarios, uh, ultimately lead to the expression of someone as great as the, the Messiah? Um, so, you know, we, we brought down different sources, and what I want to focus on today is one approach by um, Rabbi uh, Yosef Dov Salvechik, um, and uh, kind of I uh, try to like double click on his idea and how he understands this, and you know, just try to see it from a different perspective, and hopefully we walk away with a bit more clarity. And I, I also think that this is actually an amazing opportunity to kind of like segue a little bit into what Mashiach is. What do we believe in? Why is this important? Why is this part of our religion? How is it different than Christianity and Islam? Uh, is it different? Is it all the same? Are we really just telling the same story using different metaphor? Um, I think all those things are important for ourselves to clarify so we have a handle on what we actually believe in. So um, I did not expect such a large turnout today, Mechila. I printed out whatever sheets I have, so if you can share with the people around you, I'd greatly appreciate it. Um, we're going to just look at the text together a little bit. Uh, this is from a book written by Rav Salvechik called Abraham's Journey. And he highlights in this particular section a little bit of the conversation that you and I have been having over the last several weeks. So he says as follows, he says, the principle uh, first of all, if anyone's watching this and you want the actual source sheet, I'm happy to send it to you. Just let me know. You can email me at reuven at wearechazak, C-H-A-Z-A-K dot com. This principle underlies the commandments of Kiddush Hashem. Okay, what is that? Sanctification of divine's name, the prohibition of Chilo Hashem, the desecration of the divine name. Matan Torah, the giving of the Torah, initiated the messianic process of redeeming the world from its, cru from its cr crudity and profanity. Now, which means that when God created the world, he created the world with the intention of all of humanity being part of something called Am Yisrael. Am Yisrael is a concept, not just the people. The Am Yisrael, the, uh, the princes of God, that's what the word Yisrael actually means, right, is a title that was going to be given to every single Jew human being on planet Earth. It was not a unique title for a group of people roaming the Earth. But as we saw in the book of Genesis, as, society, as humanity began its process of building and creating, they very often kind of veered off the path they were meant to be on. Adam and Eve, sin, that's one generation. You have uh, Cain and Abel, sin, that's another generation. You have the generations leading up to the generation of Noah, sinning, and that's another part of humanity, losing its opportunity to connecting to God and receiving this title. And then you have the Tower of Babel, also messing it up. It's only until Abraham comes on the scene where God says, you know what, I'm giving up on a process where the world will be worthy of this title and instead give it to a human being, to one person whose family will inherit this and maybe will do it inside out. Instead of waiting for humanity as a collective to come to this place of clarity, maybe I'm making a mistake, whatever this means, because God makes no mistakes, he's giving humanity the process of choice. That's what makes this so, so difficult to understand. He's allowing us to choose as a people, as a society, as to what lives we want to live in. This is actually reminiscent a little bit about the culture that we find ourselves in today. You know, I'm not getting into the politics, uh, you know, but we definitely live in interesting times with all kinds of ideas that seem somewhat foreign. You know, uh, wokeism, whether it's right or wrong, parts of it I think are good, and a lot of it is really bad. The idea of inclusivity is an important thing, that yes, we should not be discriminating. Very important, don't discriminate. But to what extent do we take that idea? When we take discrimination to a place where we can no longer talk about factual things, like gender, where people could choose you know, their age, which is the next big fight that's gonna happen in wokeism. If I, want to, if I identify as being a 14-year-old you know, girl, I should have the right to choose that, and you're discriminating against me by not allowing me to choose that. 
okay? And what does that do with our DOB on our driver's license when we, we have uh, people who are identifying with different ages? Does age really matter anymore? Maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe we just, these are old constructs that we need to kind of walk away from. I, I obviously don't believe that. But the point that I'm making is that all of these new philosophies, ideas are meant to, to bring something good. When society is faced with a challenge that stands at odds with our philosophy, we're meant to do one or two things, okay? Either we accept it, adopt and change, or we disagree and stand up and fight for what we believe in. But there's no option of standing by idly and being apathetic and not doing anything about it. There's only one response, a response, a response to grow and change, or a response to stand up and clarify your position. There is no response, there is no, there's no option of not doing anything. When you do nothing, you are allowing a narrative to win, you are allow, you're empowering another side, you're emboldening another side to get up and do something. There are very few people that have the power of standing up to cancel culture, no question about it. But there's no question that we need to be clear about our position. Our position does not have to be a popular position. Our, pos our position has, does not have to be the, the winning position. It has to be a position. And like I've said this before, if you are unable to articulate your position, don't articulate a position. But to remain ignorant of how one can speak about a position is not an option. You're not sure how to speak about your position, then you have a, I would say, a moral responsibility to figure it out. Because if you can't speak about it, then you don't understand it. If you can't share it with somebody else, you're, you, don't, you don't really have a position, which means you need to work on clarifying your position. And this is very, I'm very passionate about that. Know what you believe in. And the only way to know what you believe in is if you could actually speak about what you believe in. It's gotta be clear to you. It doesn't have to be popular. It doesn't have to be a position that everyone, exp everyone agrees with, but certainly it has to be something you can express. Okay. So he continues, he says, the Torah was given to the Jews who were told to disseminate the word of God among the pagans, atheists, agnostics, the hedonists, thereby bringing them to their maker. It is a piecemeal, slow movement. This is what God wants. The Jewish people are given this task to ultimately bring this message of God to the world. Nevertheless, it will be consummated in the Messianic era when the mountains of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of, of the mountain. Okay, Isaiah. Matan Torah is bound up with the Messiah who will possess the heroism of his grandmothers whom the Almighty found in the non-Jewish world. They represented the heroism of loneliness, the heroism of universal commitment, the heroism of faith and waiting. The ideal of Matan Torah will be, will, will, will be fully realized only in the time of the Messiah. This great vision of the redeemed world would, have to be, would be impossible had Lot's daughters been had those daughters been destroyed in Sodom. The Torah is so interested in telling this strange story of an act of incest that took place in the, in, in the cave. Why else does the Torah record such an ugly event, if not a story of incest? It is a story of the Messiah. So it's very easy to look at the story of Lot and the daughters and say, oh, this is a bunch of crazy people, Majnun. They're, you know, they were locked in a cave, they were terrified, whatever it is, and they committed an act, an act of adultery as an extension of the immoral world that they came from. And therefore, these people were evil, and uh, we looked down upon them. But that's not the case. As a matter of fact, according to Rav Silvechik over here, he's saying, no, these were heroes. But that if you were in their circumstances, you might not have had the courage to do this act. And that this was actually a form of heroism under certain circumstances. And because this act is a, falls into a gray area, the Torah records it for a reason. And it's telling us there's something profoundly powerful about having that kind of courage under those circumstances. There's something unique about being in this place and finding the strength to get up and do something that was so bold. So he's saying that this is part of the power necessary to inspire uh, a Messiah. Maybe, maybe more than that. Maybe this, these were, this kind of chutzpah of courage right, is required in someone that's going to have the courage to stand up to the world and bring back the message of the Almighty. The personality of the King Messiah is not mono uh, monotonic, right? It's not monotonous. It's not this monotone. It's got to be, it's got to have uh, all kinds of uh, waves in there. God weaves the personality of the Messiah with vast amounts of multicolored threads like Joseph's shirt. The messianic soul is iridescent, multi-talented, rich 
in thought-filled volition and will be endowed with talents that seem mutually exclusive. But everything good and fine and noble in man must be passed on to Messiah. He will have the capacity of Gevura and Chesed. This is justice and, and kindness. He will be here with unlimited power and strength who will be defend justice. He will also be a man of unlimited loving kindness, humble and simple. All these capabilities, capacities and talents will merge in a beautiful harmony in the King Messiah. The Messiah will represent creation at its best. Apparently then Lot's daughters had something beautiful in them to contribute to Messiah's rich and powerful personality. If there was something fine in the non-Jewish families of the earth, it too will be passed on to the Messiah. Rav Lazar stated this. What it, this, is in the, this is based on the Gemara. What is it meant in the verse, and, you shall, and in you shall the families of the earth be blessed? V'niv rechu bach, right? V'rechu bacha, right? The Holy One, blessed be he, said, turning on the page right now, to Abraham, I have two godly shoots to, engra- to engraft onto you. Right, lahavrich becha, right, to give you the blessing of Ruth the Moabite and Naama the Ammonitess. These two women are the special powers and talents of Beracha that are going to be endowed into you and in your family. I, I, by the way, I could tell you this easily, but if I wasn't reading it to you, you wouldn't believe me. So I just need. That's why I'm showing you the source because I have a hard time with these ideas, and I, I read it, and I'm like, I can't believe this is actually said. This is based on the Gemara and Yevamot. That these two women with these two personalities, okay, were necessary traits, this boldness that we needed to, we were not fine in the Jewish people. Now, why not? Why aren't these traits found in the Jewish people? You know, you may be familiar, this is an idea that there are certain traits that are unique to Jews, right? That you could tell that if you find these things in a Jew or Jewess, you'll know that they are Jewish. Anyone know what they are? What's that? Anyone know what those traits are? Modesty, Modesty yeah. Baishanim is one of them. No. Right, there's, there's, a, there's a level of embarrassment. And kindness. Right, Rachmanim, compassionate. Right, these are special traits. Now, is this trait of boldness, right, part of being a Rachman and Baishanim? And I'd say no, it's the opposite. It's the opposite of that kind of trait. Chutzpanim, oh, for sure, right? We're definitely chutzpanim. I see that all the time. Baruch <laughs> atah Adonai melech olam she'akol nihiyah bevaro. Yes, it's true. That was. That, 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 it's true. But there's difference. It's a different when it comes out in a male and when it comes out in a female. Because we know that the natural trait of the feminine is to be more of a inner person, living in an inner world. And it's one thing for a male to express that, which is probably more aligned with a masculine expression of his traits. And over there, it needs to be withheld and pulled back. But within a feminine trait, there is something profoundly beautiful about a female being able to express a trait which is often masculine without losing their femininity, which all too often is not the case. All too often, you'll find a feminine power expressing itself in a masculine way and in that process they lose their own femininity but we're interested in balance in the Jewish people we want you to have this beautiful ability of expressing your feminine traits at the same time uh, tapping into a masculine traits and not being afraid of dipping your toe into that pool but not at the expense of losing your uh, femininity yeah Yeah, Leah, Leah was bold, but, she, but also to an extreme. And she, she was, she was there's, there's this fine balance. Remember, like, it's all about balance. There's all about balance, yeah. I'm going to get in trouble, I know it, I feel it. it's coming. Yeah, go on. <laughs> I'm, sitting, I'm skating on very thin ice right now. I got a room filled with women in here, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I appreciate that, Robin. Thank you. Yeah, I only have, I have less. I have less than an hour on my, on my video. To do. I, I could, I'm happy to stay later and take on all your questions, but yeah, I appreciate that. Again, I'm not, I'm not saying anything that I perceive as being uh, radical. Ultimately, what I want and what Judaism wants is balance, both on a masculine side and on a female side. The ultimate expression of a relationship is for men to understand femininity and to be able to tap, to, to dip into that pool as well. And for women to understand masculinity goes both ways. I'm not saying it for one and not the other. 
I really believe that, and I, I, and I, and I, and I, and I, and I, and I say this in the most sincere kind of way. Like I, I do believe um, that um, that the the ultimate expression of a marriage, what it ultimately wants, is for both male and female to be able to perceive the world from the other's perspective, and that and that's how we get balance. Like my spouse sees the world in a way that's very uniquely different than I do. Right, um, and I see it very different, and it's very easy to say, "Well, my way is the right way, and your way is the wrong way," and that's not true because there are different truths that are being expressed, and ultimately, we're looking for balance. Okay, so having said that, let's just get back. I want to finish this sheet over here, and then we'll uh, we'll, we'll pause for some questions, and we'll keep going. Okay, so um, I'm on the uh, right there, Lot's daughter. This is the third line from the top. Lot's daughters had something beautiful to contribute in, uh, to the um, uh, emerging personalities of the King Messiah. What did this primitive girl possess that the almighty gathering virtues and noble traits from all over the world picked up? She was uncouth and primitive. She committed incest, and yet she had the great-great-grandmother, she was the great-great-grandmother of Ruth. The Messiah will be her descendant. She was under the impression, says Rashi, that the, a cosmic cataclysm had struck and only three human beings had survived. Years ago, we were unable to imagine this, but now we understand that it is something that can happen any day. This is you talking about the Holocaust, that you know, how can we get ourselves to a place where uh, there's a massive cataclysm where the world seems like it's coming to an end, not so inconceivable anymore. Right? We could see it again happening. Right? We see what's happening right now in Ukraine, unfortunately. We see what's happening, what's going to slowly happen in China and Taiwan. She acted as she did because she wanted to save humanity. This girl wanted to rebuild the world, to start from scratch, and raise another race to take that place of a human race, which she believed had been destroyed simultaneously in the destruction of Sodom. This was heroism of an undreamt caliber. Instead of giving up, she had the courage to try to rebuild the world, to make a new humanity arise from the ashes of Sodom. She convinced her younger sister, never mind that their method was primitive and crude. These two girls took upon themselves the impossible task, something staggering and awesome. And the firstborn said unto the younger, Our father is old, and there is no man on earth. Come, let us, take, let us make our father drink wine, so we may preserve the seed of our father. The plan, per se, reprehensible, was reprehensible, but their motivation was imaginative, noble, and heroic. The, Messiah, the King Messiah will save the world. Indeed, he will achieve what he, his great-grandmothers wanted to do, the great-great-grandson, uh, the King Messiah, will accomplish what the, the lonely girls could not. The heroism of Lot's daughters consisted of their commitment to mankind and their urge to save it. You know, when I uh, think about um, the last hundred years of our history, you look at um, times and periods where there's massive amount of growth, right? So we know that the baby boomers uh, were this massive spike of, uh, of uh, children were, were born at a very short period of time in our history. And it's not an accident that most amount of children that were born during those years from like 1947 to 1952, most of those kids, the biggest spike came from Holocaust survivors, which is very difficult to understand. And I've said this before, if I was a Holocaust survivor, uh, my response to would be, I'm going on vacation, I'll see you later definitely not stopping to build a family right now. I'll see you in a few years. I'm going to Hawaii. I'm going to uh, the, uh, some island somewhere, live on a beach and drink my martinis, find some good books, and I'll see you later. I'm out. But why would I want to spend the next 30 years building and raising a family? Where did that come from? Does that make any sense? Most of these kids were born in, in DP camps, right? These were amazing, heroic people, men and women, who watched their families and literally sent to ash, okay, burnt, killed, uh, the barbarism that they saw, young kids who were ripped away from their families, women who saw their mothers, young girls saw their mothers being killed right in front of them. Where did they find the courage to go ahead and say, I'm going to get married and I'm going to build a family? Where did that come from? I have a suspicion it comes from a deeper appreciation of understanding of what love really means. Love is not about just loving and caring for yourself. Well, that's a very important trait. We all have to care for ourselves. But they understood that love comes from a, a deep desire to give back to humanity. It wasn't just about caring for yourself. This is a misplaced understanding that we have in my generation. 
that it's only an overemphasis on self-care, an overemphasis on caring for the self, but not a focus on the other, which is what I believe Lot's daughters were expressing over here. The world is coming to an end. They just watch their mother turn into a pillar of salt, if you want to take that midrash literally, right? Um, you watch your whole entire society be wiped away by you know, some cataclysmic event. You're all alone, just gets it's over. Game over, done, I'm out. Why should I do this again? But somehow they found the strength to do something which was really complicated, and they did this with the right intentions, even though it was a vulgar act. No, Ruth's Ruth's uh, Ruth's uh, uh, daughters are um, uh, Lot's daughter gave Ruth's Lot's ach. Lot's yeah, our daughters are the great great grandmother of Ruth. The older daughter. Yeah. Yeah, it's in the line. They're the descendants. She, Ruth is a descendant of Lot's daughters. Yeah. That's what we're saying. That's 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 exactly what we're saying. And not only that, we're saying it on both sides. We're saying it like we look at the, that's the whole purpose of this, the whole, the title, Rome, Royalty and Romance, is exactly, that's what we've been discussing for the last seven weeks, that we look at Lot, and that Mashiach comes from there. Ruth is a descendant of an incestu- incestuous relationship. We looked at um, uh, Ruth and Boaz, which is also a complicated relationship over there. Was Boaz allowed to marry her? We looked at Yishai, who ended up having a relationship with his wife, and had David, who everyone thought was a bastard child, right? Because Boaz separated from his wife. We look at uh, Bathsheba and David, right? Who gave birth to King Solomon, right? That was also, and we asked the question, why is the Mashiach coming from all of these interesting, complicated relationships? Yehudu Tamar, we said the same thing over there as well. We kept, so it's on the one, it is and it isn't. With, it is with Lot and the daughters, but that you can't argue about survival with David and Bathsheba. You can't say that with Yehuda and Tamar. It was not about survival over there. Right? It was not about that. And you have to go back to the, 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 the class on, Batshe- on, uh, on Yehuda and Tamar to understand the greater picture. I'm not going to go through it again. But that class explains, I think, the core of everything that we discussed um, um, as far as why it had to express itself that unique way. The idea of, of virtue and, uh, and passion aligning with each other. That concept, which where I explained in that class, is the, I think the key to understanding this whole entire, uh, su- yeah, this whole entire uh, chapter. The Messiah has another grandmother who came from, uh, from the Gentile world, Tamar, the daughter-in-law of Judah. She was a great-great-grandmother of Boaz and consequently of David, and therefore King Messiah. The Torah tells us it came to pass at the time where Judah went down from his brethren and saw that they're the daughter of a certain Canaanite. The Midrash says that at that time means that everyone was busy. Jacob was busy mourning Joseph, and Joseph was busy mourning uh, his fate. Reuben was busy mourning his uh, lost opportunity. Judah was busy choosing a wife. And God was busy creating the light of the Messiah. We saw this, uh, this Midrash uh, when we actually dealt with it. In other words, Judah set in motion a process leading to his ultimate marriage to Tamar which resulted in this inspired personality of the Messiah. Tamar was a heroic woman, a great woman. God gleaned and, and gathered beautiful things from throughout the world, gems, noble emotions, heroic capabilities. What could Tamar do that others could not? She could wait. She possessed the heroic ability and patience to wait without end. Judah told Tamar, his daughter-in-law, remain a widow in your father's house until Shelah, my son, grows up. For he said to himself, lest he also die like his brothers. Right? The first two sons died. And obviously, if, if, you have a, if you're hitting two for O, you're probably going to hit a home run again and kill the other kid. So you, Yaakov wasn't a fool. He's like, just go, go. I mean, Yehuda wasn't a fool. He said, go wait. Tamar went and dwelt with his father's house. And in the process of time, Shua's daughter, the wife of Judah, died. Tamar waited many years. She was lonely, forsaken, forgotten by everyone. Seasons passed. All her friends married, reared families. All contact with them came to an end. People treated her with ridicule and contempt. Shella married and Judah had forgotten her. And yet she waited and never said a word. Wasn't she the incarnation of the Knesset, sorry, incarnation of Knesset Israel? Thank you. Which was waited for by her, her beloved for hundreds of thousands of years under the most trying of circumstances. Did not Tamar personify the greatness of all heroic actions to wait while the uh, waiting arouses laughter and der- um, derision. The Messiah had yet another grandmother who came from to, to us from a, a Gentile world, Ruth. 
She too is heroic. Boaz acknowledges the great courage of this pagan girl in casting her lot with the people she did not previously know. Boaz answered her and uh, answered and said to her, "It has fully been told to me that what that sorry told to me all that you have done unto your mother mother-in-law since the death of your husband." and how you left your father and your mother and the land of your nativity and, are co- and, are, and have come to our, into our people that you knew not here for. May the Lord recompense you and your work and, your, and you may your reward be complete uh, from the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. When do we read these words? Uh, thanking Ruth for joining a people which she knew not. We, will nilly, we, we, we willy-nilly think of the question that is addressed, that a, any non-Jew who applies for Gerut, what prompts you to convert? Did you know that the Jews are, uh, at this time are persecuted and oppressed, despised, harassed, overcome with affliction? Of course, but was did not say it explicitly, but meaning, the meaning of the words points toward the same truth. Only a hero joins a strange and lonely people. Right? It's amazing. If you think about it, the people that you know that are converts are remarkable people. Right? They're amazing people. Why would you want to do this stuff? How many Jews struggle with being Jewish and would love the opportunity to get up and walk away from their Judaism? This is a true story. I used to teach in a seminary, Beit Yaakov. And I asked the girls in the classroom, how many of you, if you could, for one day, 24 hours, do whatever you want as a non-Jew? Right? It's a crazy question, right? How many of you would be interested in just doing whatever you want for 24 hours, right? And just no consequences, no sins. It's a, it's a get, a get out of jail free card. How many of you, for 24 hours, to do whatever you want to do, would you take that card? You know how many girls raised their hand? More than 60% of the girls in the class raised their hand. It's very tempting, right? Which is, which is really sad, which means that which means that they don't really have a deep appreciation for what it means to be a Jew. Yeah. They're not. They don't fully appreciate it. I would. I, I. I mean, it's hard, easy for me to say it now, but I would definitely never choose that. Knowing what I know now, I would never go back. I would never want. I would never want any of that. Right. I see all the depth and the beauty of everything that being Jewish means. And I know it's complicated. I know it's nuanced. I know it's not easy. I know it requires a tremendous amount of effort on my part of study, it requires a dedication, it requires commitment. I get it, I know it's hard, not easy. And it's very daunting, it could be overwhelming, but I still see the big picture, and I see the beauty and the depth of it, and I'm willing to fight for it. I'm willing to go ahead and work hard towards it, even though I'm not able to do all of it. I understand there's a process. I'm committed to the process. And this is what Ruth was, was this, this convert who understood there's a process over here. She might have been rejected, she might not have been accepted, but she was willing to go through this whole entire ordeal because she believed in a truth. How many of us can say that we're willing to fight for our truth to the very, the very bitter end? She was socially ostracized. Oh, there's that, 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 uh, that Ammonite. We don't accept converts in our community. We don't want that here. But look at the courage that she had. She showed up every single day. She came to synagogue. She participated in the community. She showed herself. She wasn't afraid. She had pride in what she believed in. She had pride in participating in, in the community that was, was so, so ready to reject her. That comes with a tremendous amount of strength and, of, of, and courage uh, and, and commitment to your beliefs. Where was I? Um, it is amazing. The words of the Bos were spoken at the dawn of Jewish history, at a time when the tension between Jew and non-Jew was yet, was yet unknown. This episode preceded Haman's hatred and the indictment of the Jews, Alexandria, the hate, the hate literature, and the Gospels. The world knew nothing of the Jewish uniqueness, his so-called isolationism and egocentrism. Nevertheless, Boaz admired Ruth's fortitude for daring to join a strange and misunderstood people. We Jews have been a strange people since the very birth of our nation. It has always been taken, it's always taken courage, the ability to do something bold, to defy public uh, resentment, and to identify with this unknown, mysterious people. What was mysterious about the Jews in early biblical times? The mere fact that they were not pagans, that they believed in one invisible, incorporeal God was puzzling to pagans. Moreover, Jews served their God by preaching morality, whereas the pagans worshipped their idols by giving gifts to them, by intoxicating themselves in orgiastic pleasures, by living like uh, uh, volpateurs, people who are just lost in pleasure. 
Ruth was a heroic woman. She joined the people alien to her and committed herself to a way of life she did not understand. She came from a pagan background where unlimited, where, where unlimited pleasures and overindulgence were the element in worship, and she joined the religion that demanded this discipline, redemption, and biological call for gratification. To outsiders, Judaism is a difficult religion. The mere fact that halacha interferes with every phase of human life, that Judaism is so concerned with trivial, the trivial makes the commitment seem staggering and almost superhuman. To convert to Judaism and accept all inclusive Judaic commitment borders on the heroic. In addition, even as early as the period of the judges to become a Jew has meant to be alienated from the rest of the world, the destiny of Avram Ha'ivri Avraham, the lonely Avraham, has always accompanied the Jews. In a word, Geirut is a heroic action on the level of observance and practical living and also at the level of one's relationship with the, Jew, with the non-Jewish world. No wonder the Talmud says that the Jews, upon responding, we shall do and obey, were called the Gibore Koach, heroes, right? Now, These traits are traits that we really want to find within ourselves, right? When we talk about a, uh, mess, a messiah, right, the savior, the redeemer, right, we all believe on some level as Jews that each of us have this power of bringing redemption, right? The messiah isn't something that we wait passively for, right? The messiah is something that we are supposed to be proactively being in, uh, involved in. It's something that we're each supposed to do, have a part to play in the bringing of the Messiah. It's not like, okay, we wait back, we do what we want to do, and, and then the Messiah will come and he will snap his fingers and you will be saved, you will be healed, you will be forgiven. This is not the Jewish concept of Mashiach. Right? The, the Jewish concept of Mashiach is the understanding that each of us have a role to play. How do I figure out what my role is meant to be? What is my role in this great cosmic struggle of the Messianic era. And I would argue that our role is to look at our unique struggles and figure out how to overcome them. That's how we play our part in the Messianic era. How do I bring Mashiach closer? By looking at my flaws, recognizing my weaknesses, and then working on them slowly and building myself up. My lifelong mission is ultimately to express the best version of me. Well, what does it look like? Well, I use something called the Torah as my mirror, right? And I see what my reflection looks like in that mirror. If it stacks up and aligns itself beautifully, then I know I'm doing something right. Keep working, making myself better and better, refine myself until it's 100% clear a mirror reflection. But if it, is, if it is not a mirror reflection, at the very least, I should be part, I should find myself in a process of growing and developing myself. You don't have to be perfect. Perfection does not exist. It's an illusion. No one is perfect. There's only imperfection. What makes us human is our imperfection. Angels are perfect, and certainly we're, we are far from angels, but we know that what makes us greater than the angels is our imperfection. It's our ability to choose. The fact that you can choose to be more than what you are, that you have the ability of expressing a better, greater version of yourself is what makes you more profound than all the angels in the heavenly spheres. This is what it means to bring the Messiah. To bring the Messiah means that I am in the part of the process of recognizing my flaws, accept, accepting my circumstances, and working towards bringing this better, greater version of me. That yes, that, that uh, this Saturday, this Friday night is Elul, that this Shabbat is Rosh Chodesh Elul, which means we are less than five weeks away from Rosh Hashanah. That we're gonna be standing again in synagogue, blowing the shofar, going through that whole entire process of looking back at the year and asking ourselves, what did we do wrong? What could we have done better? We want another chance of doing better. We want another chance of having bracha, of not having sickness. We want to have a chance of focusing on being the best that we can possibly be. That's what this time is about. That, that, that bringing Mashiach is ultimately about bringing the Messiah within ourselves into, into the world. And I, don't, I think it's a mistake to think that, well, we're just going to wait and it's going to happen by itself. Every generation that does not see the Messiah is responsible for not bringing it. What does that mean? Every generation that does not build a temple is as if they destroyed it. 
right? Talk about collective responsibility or personal responsibility. It's up to us in this generation. And I, I, and I really, I'm going to say this and I believe this. I believe that you are holier than any generation that has lived before us. How could I say that? You're crazy, Rabbi. I know, I am crazy. I'll tell you why. Ready? You see, if you were born 100 years ago, it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't be difficult for you to believe in God. You wouldn't have the distractions you have right now. The fact that you were born right now means at a time in history where we are more distracted, we have more excuses, more abundance than anyone before us, means that your neshama was so holy and so great that it has the power of overcoming the challenge that you have in this generation. And that there was no other generation that you could have been born into, no other set of parents, no other circumstances. What you have is uniquely yours. It's perfect for you. That is the loftiness of your soul. That you can overcome living in a New York City with all the distractions in the world. You could overcome a world of, of having instant everything on your, the palm of, at the palm of your hands, right? You literally have everything right there. You could go anywhere. I want to fly to another country. No problem. I whip out my uh, app, Expedia, boom. I have a ticket. I could be in the airport in a few hours. I can go anywhere I want. No problem. I don't have to have my money even. I could use, I could use a credit card. I could use somebody else's money, <laughs> right? That's the beauty of it, right? What's that? <laughs> Apple Pay even. I mean, there's, so, there's so much there at our disposal. Literally, it could be instantaneous instantaneous all you need is a phone today and once batteries can last several weeks which will happen very soon also you won't even have you'll have no paper all identification will be digital you won't have anything in your pocket anymore everything will just be on your phone or your watch whichever it is so you are living at a time of of amazing opportunity for greatness zero distraction i don't understand something oh what's the, what, what's so difficult today you google it Right? Look it up. You don't understand it? Oh, it's really hard to find a rabbi that I can relate to? That's nonsense. There are hundreds of them. You're in a synagogue with some of the most amazing, talented you know, uh, speakers, rabbis in the world, most sought after. They're there for you whenever you want. You literally can come here, pray with them, and speak to them whenever they're here. Like You have so much access that no generation before us. If you want to hear the Ben Ishchai speak, and you were living in Iraq, right? Or you're living in Syria. You had to travel by camel to go to Iraq, to Baghdad, to find him. You couldn't watch his classes on YouTube, on Torah anytime, on Instagram. It's all over the place today. There's no excuse anymore. It's all there for you. You're living in the greatest time in history. Your choices will help us express a world of Mashiach or not. These women made choices, such profound choices in their time that allow them to reach a level of excellence and greatness. God wanted those traits in the Mashiach himself. The King Messiah must be endowed with heroic qualities, for he is coming to change the status quo, to revolutionize concepts and opinions, to transform our outlook on life. He will defy evil, oppose ruthlessness, challenge injustice, and decide with equity for the meek of the earth, and he shall smite the land with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. Messianism, messianism minus heroic action is meaningless. This is true for being a Jew. To be a Jew without any action on your part is kind of like, I love this, this metaphor, it's like having a sport with only fans and no players. It's like a sport with only fans and no players. What happens to a sport if you only have fans? No one's playing the game. What's that? There's no game. It's over. And I find that that's so, such a powerful you know, uh, metaphor for the Jewish people. We love it. I don't want to play the game. <laughs> I don't want to get in the ring. I'm not willing to stand up. I'm not willing to say anything. I'm going to keep quiet and stand aside and not, do, not get involved. It's so, so much easier. I'll be a fan. I support you. You know how come we love Chabad? Because they're playing the game. They're going to put up the big menorah outside. They're going to wear their big kippah. They're going to let them do it. I'll support them. I don't want to do it. But that, my friends, is not the goal of Judaism. The goal of Judaism isn't to have a, to cl a class, a division of classes of Jews, right? The rabbinic class and the non-rabbinic class. This is nonsense. The purpose, the function of a rabbi is to inspire the people to be independent if the rabbis create dependence, they are failing their community. The rabbi's job is to inspire you to be you, 
not to tell you what to do, but to clarify what you should do. Right? That's what his real job is. You're supposed to be a, we're supposed to be a mamlechet kohanim, a nation of priests, an or legoyim. How can I be an or legoyim? If I got, oh, Rabbi, what do I got to do again? What do I got to say? How do I do it? You're missing the point. That's not the role. The role is, the goal is independence. Independent thinking. Yes, difference of opinions is, are good. It's okay. Sephardic, Ashkenazi, Hasidic, Litvish, whatever color you want, I love it. I love all of it. <coughs> I'd much rather you take a stand for something than fall for anything. I'd much rather you be in a position of clarity and knowledge than be completely being able to be bamboozled and hoodwinked by everything around you. Right? Mashiach requires action. To be a Jew requires action. That's what we're asking for. When we speak about Mashiach, it's not just, oh, the day where all war ends. Yes, but, but, but wanting Mashiach means that I want to live in a world of action, a world where people are able to express the best of themselves. Um, the poor biblical times used to glean and gather after the reapers. The Almighty too gleaned and gathered, not ears of corn, but beautiful inclinations and noble virtues. And then he wove the soul of the King Messiah. God found the heroic girl in Moab. The Almighty was busy with the formation and the creation of Messiah's personality, which was to embody the finest, most beautiful elements concealed in the, in the depths of mankind. God brought the girl to Judea so that she could collaborate with him in creating Messiah personality. She contributed to the heroism of, lonely, uh, of uh, loneliness and acceptance of the un incomprehensible character, no matter how heroic and revolutionary her spirit was in her. Heart was in her heart, deeply loyal and grateful. In fact, her heroism was the consequence of her loyalty to her mother-in-law. Her first words, do not entreat me to leave you to tell a story of great humility. She revered her mother-in-law. When Naomi told her to do something odd, namely to visit the threshing floor and uncover Boaz's feet, she did not argue with her mother-in-law. <laughs> she did it according to all her mother-in-law's, uh, 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 all her mother-in-law bade her. Respect for her elderly, humility, and a sense of gratitude are indispensable. Heroism is important, provided it goes hand in hand with humility and loyalty, right? Uh, we call this class, uh, the series is called uh, Romance and, uh, uh, sorry, Royalty and Romance, right? And uh, it's, that's what it was. We're talking about noble families that were, that the, whose passions allow them to make these amazing choices that most of us would not allow ourselves to make if we found ourselves in those circumstances. Um, I'm certainly, uh, I don't, I don't uh, we don't ask for challenge. We don't ask ourselves to, be, to find ourselves in positions that are, uh, that are gray. We want to do what's right. We want to do everything above board. But at the same time, when each of us are challenged and put in a position to stand up and act, know that that is when you are being challenged. When you have the opportunity of drawing forth a trait that enables the world to get the inspiration it needs to bring the Mashiach into the world. We're a symbiotic unit, all of us. Kol Yisrael Arevim Zelazeh. We are all interconnected. And what I do impacts you, and what you do impacts me. That when you are the best of you, you inspire me to be the best of me. And when I'm the best of me, hopefully it inspires you to be the best of you. So we work together in doing this. So when we read the stories, again, that lead up to this particular time in, in history, which ultimately is going to express a greater time in history, what we're really looking for is uh, how, why are we telling the story A? B is, what am I still learn from it? And, and C is, how do I incorporate these ideals, these ideas into my life? That's what the action is. There's, a, the Torah says a uh, Torah without action is like a tree without fruit. It's like, sorry, it's like a tree without fruit, right? What does that mean? That ultimately, a tree is meant to produce something. We're all here to do something. We're not meant just to sit and take. Why is the Dead Sea called the, yeah, the Dead Sea? Anyone know? Because nothing lives in it. This is true. But also, it's the only body of water that only takes. Right? It only takes. It does not give anything. And when you're a taker and you don't give, you're considered to be dead. Only a dead person only can take and not give back. Right? Um, that is where this idea of the Dead Sea, all bodies of water give, except for the Dead Sea. It is the lowest place on planet Earth. 
it is only taking, if you're only taking, you're dead. Right? How, what does it mean to be alive, to be living? Means the opportunity of giving back. The opportunity of doing good. That is what Mashiach is. Bezrat Hashem, um, next week, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to go through what does the Messianic, um, it's not my ideas, it's just I'm going to bring down the sources for it. What do Jews believe in? We speak about Mashiach, the time, the person, the personality. We'll double click on those sources, God willing, and, and walk away with a little bit of clarity for ourselves. Um, I will take your, there's enough time for questions now, so I'll take your questions. Any questions? Yes. Questions, yeah, go for it. Go for it. Let's start with one. Yeah. Correct. Correct. Meaning that what the midrash over there is saying is that um, early on, at that time, even before, even before, th- there was still a need for a mess- messianic time. Now, when we speak about um, this concept, is very important. Ready? We know that the Torah is an antidote to Adam and Eve's sin in the Garden of Eden, right? And therefore, that if the Jewish people would not have sinned by Mount Sinai, they would have been in a position to undo the sin of Adam and Eve. Now, we also know that the women were not involved in the sin of the, uh, the sins that took place under, in, in Mount Sinai. So the question you should be asking me, if that is in fact true, why were the women still afflicted with the curses of Eve? What we're saying ultimately... What's that? That should have been their tshuva, right. They, did, they, they, they overcame it. They did everything right. They didn't right. Take they, okay, so it's true. They did not take action. Oh, excellent. So no, that's, 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 really, that's the answer, ultimately. The answer is that we're... The answer is that we are living in a world of masculine and feminine traits and that we need to um, perfect each other. The system doesn't work if one group has reached a level of clarity and, and, uh, and holiness while the other has not. So that it has to be a tandem race that we win together. So it's true that the women, why we say in the merit of the righteous women, we are always redeemed, right? Now, their redemption has always been clear. Women, uh, in Judaism's view, are always holier, greater than men, right? Now, having said that, we see that they, even though they reached a high level of holiness during Mount Sinai, and they were able to get to this re- d- deep level of clarity, it was not enough to bring the men with them. And uh, therefore, they were still uh, stuck in, the, in, the, in, the, in a masculine world of sin that has not been rectified. And hopefully, during the time of the Messianic times, we'll be able to bring both male and female up into that level. So God knew this at Sinai, that the goal was the Messianic era, and it needed both players to get there. All that means that, that uh, Yehuda and Tamar, that he was planting the seeds, it means that, that it was going to come through this line. That this Messiah would come from this line. There's something unique about Judah's power and his truthfulness, his hoda'ah, his level of being grateful and having hakarat tov that made him the right candidate, the vessel to express a messianic time. And something powerful about Tamar. What's that? They knew that, then why did he threaten to destroy us so many times after Sinai? Because, okay, this is, I'm not sure if you're aware of this. I'm gonna, I'll take your question in a minute. But this world, based on Kabbalistic text, is not the first world that God created. The, the, um, the uh, Mikubalim teach us that this is the 974th iteration of creation. There were 974 different um, worlds that were created before this one, and in each one they were completely obliterated, never receiving the Torah. And this is the first time in the history of creationism that humanity reached a level where they were able to get a Torah. There's no group before us, no groups of people before us that were able to get to this kind of clarity. This is the first time in its history of creation. So that makes this very profound, that everything that's happening right now is unique. So therefore, God, yet yeah, was ready to destroy it. As, you know, and it's interesting because if you ever look at Rabbi Isaac of Akko, who was a student of the Ramban, Nachmanides, he's the same person that actually read through the Zohar when it first was published in, in the 13th century, 14th century, and agreed that it was a... Uh, 
a uh, accurate transmission of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai's ideas, and he popularized it. He was a very big rabbi, and he, in his works, that he wrote this a long time ago. Remember, this is written almost 800 years ago. He says that the world, the universe that we're in, is 15 billion years old. Now you have to understand that was a crazy number to use 800 years ago, because when you look at scientists in the mid 1800s, they were saying the universe is only 200,000 years old. You know, 500, no one was using numbers in the billions. He wrote this 800 years ago, and he got to this number using this 974 generations and using the amount of years they last, and he has this whole interesting calculation, pages and pages, of why the universe is 15 billion years old, which actually works really nicely with what scientists today are saying as far as the age of the universe. Well, they're not wrong. What they're saying ultimately is, I, I, what they're saying is it's 5,782 years from the time of Adam. And I don't have a problem with that. I have a problem with saying that it's that what happens before Adam is included in the same time period. I have no problem saying that 5,782 is because what we're really celebrating isn't the creation of the world. We know that the world is actually created in, in Nisan, right? In the month of Nisan. That's why Rosh Chodesh, that Rosh Chodesh Nisan is the first month in the Jewish calendar. Do you know that? That Elul is actually the seventh month, sorry, the sixth month in the Jewish calendar. Tishrei is the seventh month in the Jewish calendar. Well, I understand, if we're celebrating Rosh Hashanah, the beginning of the new year, then why is it started in month seven? And really what we are celebrating in Rosh Hashanah is the birth of Adam, that Adam was born on Rosh Hashanah, right? It's not just the creation. The, the world was actually created on, according to that opinion, was created on Chaf He Elul, right? Seven days before. What's that? Yeah, so it's a big machloket in the Gemara between two opinions by Yeshua and Rabbi Elazar. So when it was created, and the way in which the Gemara uh, kind of resolves it is that there's a difference between thought and action. The thought of the world happened in Nisan, and that counts as creation because for God, thought and action are one. But the actual physical manifestation of the world happened on Chav Hei Elul, Adam being born on uh, Aleph uh, Tishrei. And that's what makes this day so profound. It's Yom Hadin. It's the day of judgment, the day of creation. Everything started on this one day. That's because that's the first human being. And when we're talking about the year changing, 5,782 was from the time that Adam was on the scene, his realization, his ability to connect to the divine. That happened 5,782 years ago. I don't have a problem with that. Yes, I have a problem with the age of the universe and so on and so forth, but I could hear all the arguments on both sides. But technically, he wasn't Jewish. Well, no, he was not technically Jewish. He would fall under the... What we know, you know, and, and, and more than that, I would even argue there are Midrashim, and this is definitely not a popular uh, idea, uh, certainly it's uh, not popular at all, um, uh, th that Adam was not the first man. But what makes Adam unique was that he was the first man to recognize God. And he was the first prophet at Adam HaRishon. Adam HaRishon was the first prophet. There were other people there with Adam, like for example, the Nachash. We spoke about this last summer. The Nachash was not a snake. He was another person that uh, was, uh, who had an affair with Chava, right? Very different uh, take on the story. But the Midrashim definitely point out to there being other people around with Adam. What makes Adam unique is his ability to, uh, to connect to God. And his uh, prophecy is what makes him unique. And he's, uh, he's, he's, uh, he stands out from everybody else. That's why he was alone. God had to create a female for him that was on the same spiritual level as Adam because there was no one else around. He reached this high level. Both him and her are representative of two individuals that are meant to bring a new spiritual caliber, caliber of human beings into the world. And that's what they were tasked with. And they failed on some level. Yeah, that was before. That's before. That's way before. Yeah. Any other questions? Question. One second, she, one second. Robin, Robin had a question. Yeah, I have a question about what you want to piggyback on that for a second. So, the, the, these things that scientists have found are all magnets. Yeah. Is that supposed to be preceding Adam? Yeah, that definitely does precede Adam. I mean, like, we have, we have lots of questions. When we look at the world, we find things that are way older than 5,782 years old. Right. right? We look at the Egyptian civilization, is older. We look at we look at you know we look at things we found the civilization is twenty five thousand years old in like in the mountains of, of Turkey some fascinating like like it's like unbelievable like a very advanced technological you know city that is you know we don't understand that we can't relate to it because we all thought civilization only started six thousand years ago 
And the Chachamim say that when God built and created these 974 generations, they all lived on planet Earth. It's this planet. That when you look on the Earth itself, it is a graveyard for previous civilizations that were built and destroyed. Correct. Correct. That there's, 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 separate, there's separate things. There's, there's Breshit, Bara, Lukim, the Shemayah of the Arts. That is talking about the creation of the universe, right? And that, that the earth and its creation actually doesn't make sense in the story of Genesis because in the story of Genesis, the, uh, the earth is created before the sun. And that's not how it works. You can't have life without a sun, right? So we're talking about potential of things that come about. And if that is true, if, there was, if the earth was created before the sun, then how are you measuring time? We know that one day represents the earth spinning around its axis around the sun and a whole year around the sun itself. So you don't have time in the first three days of creation until the sun is created. But it says in the, in the Torah that it was created after the first day. We say, so what, what, is, that, is that a 24 hour period or is that something else? If you want to understand that, by the way, I definitely recommend reading Gerald Schroeder, who is a uh, MIT scientist. About, about, what's that? Yeah, Gerald Schroeder wrote a book called, um, he wrote a book called um, Genesis and the Big Bang. It's Genesis and the Big Bang. Gerald Schroeder. Schroeder, um, he spells it, I think, S-C-H-R-O-D-E-R. And um, he is an MIT, he has two PhDs from MIT. He was a nuclear physicist um, about Teshuva, and he wrote a book called Genesis and the Big Bang, where he basically uh, goes through a mathematical scientific approach to explaining the seven days of creation, which are really 15 billion years old. And in a nutshell, what he says is that when you look at uh, time, time is very much correlated to speed. The faster you're moving, the slower time is around you. So he says that if you look at the, even the, the, the Big Bang theory of the expansionists, that time was moving so much faster that if you were to st spend 24 hours in that first day of expansiveness, right, uh, it would be billions of years. We're that when What's, right, same idea, same idea. That when we're... Correct. Yeah, it's, like, it's, hard, it's hard to understand it, but think about this. You want to do a thought experiment with me? It's actually very cool. I just did this on Shabbat with my guests. It takes seven minutes for the sun's rays to hit the earth. Okay, so that means when you see the sun's rays right now, it was seven minutes ago. That means if the sun stopped existing, it just disappeared, it would take you seven minutes to figure it out. That whatever you're seeing on earth is the old rays. Okay, now, it takes us, if we were traveling at the speed of light, it would take us seven days to get to the furthest planet. Okay, in our solar system, the speed of light, okay? If you're traveling at the speed of light, it would take you seven days to get to Pluto. Okay? Well, Just so you understand that. I, 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 that's my point. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, ready? Now, that means everything that we perceive in our solar system has to do with light. I can't see anything without light. Everything we see in this room is light bouncing off our faces. You're not seeing me, you're seeing my reflection. Okay? Think about that for a minute. Now, having said that, when I look into a telescope and I'm looking at something that's 50 million light years away, I'm looking at events that took place 50 million years ago. Because it takes that long for the light to get to me. Which means if we reversed it for a moment, if there was an alien on a planet 50 million light years away from us, and they were looking at our planet, what would they be looking at? They'd be seeing the dinosaurs. Think about it for a second. It goes both, it goes both ways, yeah. right? Because you can't see anything in real time. It has to do with how fast light can move. So everything that we perceive around us is taking forever to get to us. And until we figure out new ways of, uh, new technologies of seeing things, this is why this whole James Webb telescope, you might be hearing about it, is so fascinating, is because it's using infrared spectrums to see things that we cannot see before. But it's fascinating that everything around us is light, and even with the fastest thing in the world, the speed of light, it's still, we're still so limited in the universe that we're in, the, the solar system we find ourselves in. Correct. So we know, well, we, we do know that actually, we know that we could actually, we could actually, this experiment was done last week, we were able to slow down the speed of light, where it's actually visible, which is kind of cool. 
They did this, this fascinating experiment that happened last week. And we also know that it is possible to move faster than the speed of light. We didn't do that experiment? We did that experiment also. This last six months ago. You can Google it. Yeah. What's that? Oh, we also know the Earth is moving a little faster. This is true also. Yes, that things are moving faster. This is all true. But uh, we do know that there are things that are faster than the speed of light. We know that things can move faster. We also, whatever, this is a whole separate conversation. Uh, 